أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله تعالى على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا My beloved siblings of humanity we just wanted to spend some thoughts on uh, what has been transpiring in uh, in the Middle East at large uh, pertaining to this, uh, this this warfare as we have done uh, prior in terms of elaborating what has uh, transpired for those who are just understanding and getting caught on to the the events that are happening yes there are historical aspects which we cannot necessarily go as far back to elaborate on but nevertheless we have what transpired uh, as a breach on the israeli uh, open uh, cage of the palestinian resistance and uh, this Palestinian resistance, they call Hamas. Israelis do not have Ha, so they use Ha. Uh, now, of course, uh, they made it seem like it was all, you know, such a barbaric attack. They claim that uh, this Hamas resistance, and we're going to use resistance more often. They don't want to do anything but kill all Israelis, all Jewish people. And when they came, they sexually assaulted, abused sexually the women. And then they mutilated them. And then they raped them. And then they shot them in that order. I don't know why anybody would, you know, with an operational mindset, instead turns around and decides to rape before mutilating um, and before sexually assaulting, but that's that's the narrative of the IDF. Um, so they claim that this was such a heinous attack and it was the worst since the Holocaust and it affected all of the Israeli society and, you know, the breaches uh, was so devastating and they burned and bombed everybody and... You know, the atrocities just never end. And until today, we're still coming out with some elements of that. Anyway, uh, it took less than 24 hours for the IDF, particularly uh, Air Force, to start bombing, 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 bomb, 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 everywhere that they just wanted to in Gaza. And I believe uh, they decided to mobilize the entire forces, reserved included, and move them on the border of Gaza. And of course, uh, they had to shift some of their forces to northern border that they have with Lebanon because the Lebanese say, or they claim, not the Lebanese, but um, what is known as an Iranian back proxy, according to the news media, and labeled as a terrorist group, they're known Hezbollah, not Hezbollah, like the Israelis, but Hezbollah, which means the party of Allah. It's, a uh, yeah, that that's actually in the Quran, in Surah Mujadila, which is between the Surah of the Iron and the Surah of uh, Hashr. Um, so, when uh, they decided to move in with the ground force. They did not listen to reason. They were already revengeful. They were already raged with anger. <clears throat> and they decided to immediately uh, cut off all basic necessities to the entire population. They actually stated that, you know, the, the idea of government. And so they decided that uh, they were going to move in from ground, air, and sea. This is, and so they had their forces mobilized. They moved in from the north, from the center, uh, well, beach way, and they're also making from the south, all right, trying to cut up 
the Gaza Strip and encircle it. They claimed that they had the North at one point. They had, you know, militants cornered into the tunnels at one point. But let's just take it one step at a time. The progress of the IDF began from the uh, 21st, at least, we can say from our end, we spotted. Well, prior to that, um, let's not forget, there's a very important element. We don't want to leave that out. With this breach, the resistance captured live and dead hostages. Right? They took the corpse, the bodies of hostages who were they had killed or whatever, and they kept them with them. And they also uh, took with them over 200 Israeli hostages. Let's not forget that. Israel goes in on the ground maybe about two weeks after they start the bombing. So we are talking about around the 20, 19th, 20th, 21st, whatever. And they decide that they're going to use the these things, these tanks. If anybody's not familiar with what a tank is, it's practically a military vehicle that shoots off rockets, okay? And it has sensors also. And modern day uh, tanks have what are known as sensors and they can sense danger practically so many feet away and they can respond to it automatically. So they're going with their tanks and they're going with other uh, vehicles such as bulldozers and, uh, you know, these military, you know, just transport vehicles, uh, trucks or whatever. And uh, as they're going in from the north side, they start to be attacked. So they have to respond to that. As well as certain elements in the Arabian peninsula itself, known as the Houthis, who are also a, known as also a proxy mili paramilitary group who have managed to fight the superpower alliance of the Middle East, meaning the, the Sauds and the international back government to a standstill. And they're in control, so they've also been sending rockets to, sh to Israel and to any ships that are on their way to Israel from that sea. They've closed it out. And right around this time, the United States has also sent support for Israel. Yeah, military ships and this, what have you, all these things. As they move in to the ground uh, assault, a few things happen. They realize that they're coming up against a formidable enemy. Uh, from the time that we have followed this entire history or this entire situation for for the past 40 years when we say that these resistant uh, forces at some point as young boys and girls they just had rocks it would their fathers used to throw rocks so for only two generations now it requires all of this force for you to go in and only to find out that you are not following the art of war. The art of war says you should not have gone in. You should not have gone in because you did not know the ground. You did not know the ground because you knew that the tunnel system, metro system tunnels is there and you did not know where and how it actually was built or you did not know the, the, the blueprint of it. So you sent dogs and they were killed people, special forces, thinking that they can get in there and rescue hostages from the U.S. as well as Israeli forces, they got killed. So the, bull, the, 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 the tanks, unfortunately, they are unable to go underneath the ground. The airplanes cannot go underneath the ground. Your ships cannot go underneath the ground. So, but you keep fighting and claiming that you are gaining some type of upper hand. When you're fighting a guerrilla warfare, the art of war says that all that needs to take place is that the resistance survives. Unfortunately, prior to this war, this, this 7th October, IDF was going to normalize with Saudi Arabia. A lot of other countries in the area were going to normalize with Israel. 
a lot of countries were going to support the normalization of Israel. But immediately after the bombardment, they started pulling away. They started saying no more, no, more normalization and your ambassadors started getting kicked out. Now, not only that, but you still are suffering because, and I have to be very du- direct and frank about the situation. I look at the casualty list of the IDF. These are leaders. These are administrators. These are commanders. These are commandos. These are the finest of, of really a military regiment. I have never seen a casualty. Look back at Afghanistan and see how many colonels were lost in Afghanistan or how many majors were lost in Afghanistan in the course of 20 years. Here, you're only talking two weeks. You're losing colonels. I, I even got a list of a general on there. You're losing uh, a field commanders, like a sergeant, a master sergeant. You're losing sergeant majors. And unfortunately, um, I'm seeing the ages of, of these military uh, uh you are losing, you know, all type of leadership, you know, when it comes to, and most importantly, because you refuse, refusing, you know, international cry of a ceasefire, you say you have to get all the hostages and you also have to eliminate the resistance. Although every military analyst Every social, economic, psychological component says otherwise for numerous reasons. It's an ideology. You must be resisted as long as you're an occupier. You cannot be the victim. You're the occupier. You cannot say, I'm occupying your house, but I'm defending myself. So during this time, you don't liberate anybody. You don't fulfill that. The art of war says if the occupier, if the attacking force does not secure their mission, does not accomplish their mission, then the occupied wins. And so far, you have not fulfilled your mission. They have won. They're winning. Your tanks, unfortunately, they're hitting them from left, right, front, back, up. And for the first time ever in military history, I urge anybody to tell me if they've ever seen a tank get hit upside down on a ground, again, of, 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 of your enemy's choosing, you are losing big time. That's why the art of war specifies topography. For a tank to get hit upside down, we don't even have it in games today. You can you have game of tanks or whatever. You will not find an a tank being hit upside down, but how did it happen? These folks know their metro system underground so well that they are emerging from beneath the rubble and they're holding the RPG upside down. And from upside down, they're managing to to hold the RPG upside down and hit the tank and hit your tanks. You're losing a lot of leaders who, again, very young ages, you know, the age of the uh, lieutenant colonel and the colonel, these majors that you're losing, these sergeants, 21, 25, 36, you know, the most experienced ones are only in their early 40s. I mean, all the resources that had to be placed into uh, training and equipping them, and you didn't just lose a hundred or several hundreds. Uh, 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 deaths, because that's not the way that this is counted. This is counted by the amount of casualties you suffer that can never be made up. People are losing, obviously, their limbs, they're getting blown up, you know, although they are trying to rally the support of their regiment, they're the first to go. It's demoralizing. And at this point in time, once you got to realize, or once you said and accepted a pause or a ceasefire, what did you do? When it's time for you to release Palestinian prisoners, whether they're adolescents or juveniles or elderly, which was prisoner for prisoner, three for one, IDF re-arrest as many people as they released. Then they put terms 
on those that they release that they cannot celebrate, they cannot go to gatherings, no, you know, show of that. And they make sure they contact the parent next of kin and tell them basically the same thing. Then they make sure they release them opposite from where they said they were going to release them at. So if the parents or whoever came to pick them up from where. So all these from where they were initially supposed to release them from, they would not release them from there. They would tell them to go home, only to release them from somewhere else so that they would not be celebrated. This was the whole tactic. Then, on top of that, you already were reluctant. It, could, it was said all between your spokespersons who could not hold their own weight. It was showing all over their faces. It was again showing on the faces of your troops. You did not want the ceasefire. What did your spokesperson, Levi, and the other one, government spokesperson, the military government uh, say, or military IDF say, is that this ceasefire is only going to benefit Hamas. This was the whole reason for not wanting a, a ceasefire. Uh, then, when it did take place and the prisoner exchange happened, we're getting narratives from the prisoners that you keep in the idea of custody and how inhumane you're treating them. And it's coming out. And it's showing on their faces as well. We, everybody sees the wounds on this on these young generation. You know, you're trying to, 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 to get an ideology of resistance out of them. You actually turn them into stronger men and women is what, you, what you've done. So now those who are held on who you claim are so barbaric this October 7th and next door to ISIS. And by the way, there's something I have to say right away about this resistance, okay? They did not carry out what it is that they said they were going to carry out. And what was that? Indiscriminate bombing of buildings they said they would slaughter. But I'm, I'm glad, all right, we're all glad that they did not help you out and given the narrative of ISIS. That's... <laughs> That's what ISIS did. They, they did not do that. They released hostages that they even cared for, that they even medically cared for. The first hostages that they released, they said everybody was medically cared for. And we saw it on their faces in those images. Everybody was smiling. Everybody was happy. Everybody was saying goodbye. The crowd was cheering them on. Everybody was given water. Uh, you, you saw some thumbs up and high fives going on. So Israel did not like that image. <laughs> it does not deliver the narrative that Israel wants. So what does Israel do? They stopped the ceasefire. They said, this cannot go on. Like we said before, it's only benefiting Hamas. We're not losing on the informational front. And this is making it worse. So they break the ceasefire. And their deal is, they broke it. We broke it. It's broken. We're going to get going. But we knew you did not want the ceasefire from the beginning. So you say it's only force that's going to get our hostages back and eliminating Hamas is the objective. So we go on from the first of this month. We broke the ceasefire. January 1st, we're back to the battlefield. And during the battlefield, uh, Israel, you have actually moved to the south, because remember, you cut Gaza in two and you were focused up north, and you suffered a lot of casualties there, but after you broke the ceasefire, you decided, okay, now it's time for us to venture south. So you go there, and you're facing a lot of casualties. The public and the relatives of those who are still in custody call you out, and you refuse. President of the United States by this time, Mr. Joe Biden, says that you all have committed by default uh, war crimes and that's your indiscriminate bombing, but yet you decide to continue. David Cameron, along with his uh, German counterpart, has also called you out. The Gulf of Eden is being closed. You've, 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 you've committed your navy there, but it wasn't it wasn't strong enough to deal with the Houthis, so you had to get the U.S. to come and help out there. And commercial ships are being stopped. You have also committed United States to being attacked in Iraq and in Syria, and demonstrations all over the world. On top of which, 
you have managed to rescue some hostages. Everybody has to understand, Israel has accomplished some of its objective. They have rescued some hostages, I believe it was four or five days ago, um, but they lost two special force units or two special force soldiers in that from the unit, as well as they were rescuing dead hostages. So you actually came out worse than you went in. You went in at least with a full unit, and you came out with two less than you went in with, and you recovered two dead hostages. Congratulations. Now, people might think that's not an accomplishment, but, you know, by all means, feel as you like. So Friday, this past Friday, was the very first day that Israel had all practical purposes to prove that their force was the force to actually uh, cause the liberation of any hostage. But prior to that, Israel wants to say that the Red Cross are responsible for not getting the hostage. It's like the Red Cross was supposed to go and make sure they visited so that we can send in, you know, our own intelligence party so we can tell where all the hostages are. So 